And this morning we have an exemplary champion for each of those three pillars on which Palm Beach Atlantic University stands. We're delighted that today is yet another chapter in the unfolding story of the Lemieux Center for Public Policy, a center of excellence at Palm Beach Atlantic University. And this year, our campus is buzzing with full enrollment, largest new class in the history of the university. We are exploding with excitement about the programs and development of our university family and campus. To introduce our special guest, please join me in welcoming our dear friend, our colleague, Senator George Lemieux. Thank you, Bill. Good morning. Thank you, President Fleming. It's so nice to be back at PBA, the new school year. There's a lot of excitement on campus, and I'm glad that we can start the year off with the Lemieux Center for Public Policy with such a great speaker for you today. Uh, it's my great privilege to introduce to you not only one of Florida's leaders, but a very good friend of mine, Speaker Will Weatherford. Will is a Floridian who grew up in the Tampa Bay area. He is a, uh, a product of a family of nine children. Nine children. He was homeschooled, but then attended high school, as is a rite of passage in the Weatherford family, uh, Land Lakes High School. And you may know, you've, you might have heard the name Weatherford before in association with football. So if you are a Weatherford boy, you must be the quarterback at Land Lakes High School. And then there's been another Weatherford that you may know of, one named Drew Weatherford, who was the quarterback for Florida State. Uh, Will is a, a person who has found public service to be something that compelled him from an early age. After attending college and graduating with a degree in business, starting off in a real estate career, he had a chance to meet another great Florida leader, and that was Speaker Alan Benz. And Speaker Benz encouraged him to get involved in public service, to come to Tallahassee to work with him, and that led to Will seeking the Florida legislature, running for the Florida legislature, and now since last year being the Speaker of the House of Representatives in Florida, one of the two legislative leaders that presides over the bodies that run our legislature in Florida, and he was unanimously selected to be Speaker of the House. Uh, he lives here in Florida, in the Tampa Bay area with his wife Courtney. They have three children, three daughters, so which means he needs to have one more to catch up to the Lemieux family. That boy's on the way. It took us three boys to get the girl, so maybe the reverse will be the same for you. He's a, he's a wonderful friend, and I'm glad that he could be here with us today to kick off what is going to be a very exciting year for the Lemieux Center for Public Policy at Palm Beach Atlantic. So without any further ado, let me invite to the podium my friend, Speaker Will Weatherford. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I appreciate the very kind introduction. Um, you know, public service is a tough thing, and I really quickly just want to thank the senator for, he actually called me uh, not too long ago when we had the discussion about me coming down and, and being a part of this forum, and uh, it was a unique opportunity, number one, because I'm a huge fan of the senator, and, you know, I've spent time with him, and, and people sometimes don't understand when you are a statewide elected official like a United States senator, the sacrifice involved with that, and speaking of your four children, I'll never forget being in the car with you once. We were on our way to like an outback dinner or something like that, and your wife had called, and I think three of your four were sick, you know, and you were going to be gone for two or three days. And I know what that's like because I left my house this morning, and two of my three were sick. And so my wife looked at me, and she said, now, where are you going? When are you coming back? And, um, but the sacrifice, I, I believe uh, something that uh, Senator Lemieux said when he first was appointed to the United States Senate was, he said, I'm going to get six years of work out of 18 months. He had 18 months to do it, and he absolutely did that. And I think... The people from the outside who were watching, like myself and many others, and saw the impact that you had on that body uh, in that period of time was unprecedented and speaks to your character. And I'm really excited to, uh, to be here and be a part of uh, the Lemieux Center for Public Policy. I don't know anybody who understands public policy probably better than you, and it's just an honor to be here. So thank you very much. And I had a chance to walk through the campus just now with President Fleming, who was walking me through. I was asking him, you know, what a traditional student looks like here. And I was blown away by the fact that over 50% of the students are from Florida. 
Uh, I, I knew there was probably a strong base. I went to a, uh, an institution not too um, uh, far away from here called Jacksonville University. It was a private institution. We had about 1,800 to 2,000 students on campus. Very similar feel. And I loved the fact that I knew my professors. They knew me, and if I missed class, they would call me. You guys know what that's like, right? <laughs> and so it was different than going to a big institution. And uh, I thought that made a huge difference. And, and in fact, I'll talk about it in a minute, but my, my political career actually started in college and getting engaged in college. And uh, as you guys can probably tell by looking at me, that wasn't that long ago, as I'm a young person. Um, you mentioned, uh, Senator, my family, and, and I will tell you, it is important that you have an understanding of <coughs> Uh, my foundation, the reason I believe in what I believe in with regards to free enterprise and uh, with regards to where I think our country came from and where I hope it continues to go, is rooted in my mom's education that she gave me. Um, I didn't have the, the opportunity uh, that a lot of kids have. We grew up in a low-income household. I was one of nine kids. We moved a lot. Uh, my dad worked usually two or three jobs. Uh, but my mom decided at a very early stage that she was going to homeschool her children. And you know, teaching your kids to read and write and you know, early mathematics is important, but that wasn't why she did it. She did it because, uh, for example, uh, when we stand up and we give a pledge, my mom wanted me to understand who I was pledging allegiance to. What is this, why are we pledging allegiance to this country? What does that mean? What is the purpose behind it? Where did it come from? She wanted me to understand that. And when we said a prayer, she didn't just want us to pray, she wanted me to understand who I was praying to. She wanted me to have a relationship with Christ and with my Lord, and so that as I went through life, both the ebbs and flows that life can bring, that I would have that f solid foundation, those roots in the ground, so that when the wind blows, and it does, that you won't move and you'll be able to withstand it. So I give my mother all the credit in the world, and, I, and for those of you who are students here, what you're getting, I believe, and I, I hopefully what, what you feel like you're receiving as you're, as you're going here at Palm Beach Atlantic is those roots are growing. They're giving you that foundation that is stronger than just an academic foundation. It's not just about knowing facts. Uh, anybody can memorize facts. Anybody can memorize literature. Anybody can become an expert in math uh, to some extent. But life brings very unique challenges. And having an understanding of what you believe in and why is probably the most important thing that I think you can have. And I hope and I believe uh, that this, the university is doing that for you. Now, being young and being public service is a very unique thing. Uh, I can tell you right now there are those who like term limits and don't like term limits. I can tell you right now with certainty without term limits I wouldn't be standing here before you. There's no chance I would have been elected to the Florida legislature. There's certainly no chance I would be Speaker of the House. And so I'm very uh, happy to have had a chance to, to come here with term limits. Kind of an interesting story how I got elected. In 2006, I got a call uh, from a couple of people, uh, but one of them was a guy by the name of uh, Senator Marco Rubio who called me, who was the incoming speaker, to say that Starting tomorrow, Governor Bush was appointing my state representative, Ken Littlefield, to the Public Service Commission. And it was seven weeks from Election Day. The ballots had been printed, and the, and the name Ken Littlefield was already going to be on the ballot. And his question to me was, we have to find somebody to run in his stead. Are you interested? I was 26 years old. I'd been married for three months. Had no plan on running for office whatsoever. Was completely focused on getting away from politics, as I had just worked in the, in the, in the political sector, for the former speaker. And I said, well, how long do I have to decide about this? And he said, well, how about 24 hours? <laughs> OK? So I had 24 hours to decide whether or not I wanted to run for office. And you probably figured out the story. I decided to, sought some counsel, prayer, thought, and I jumped in. Seven weeks later, I won and was elected to the Florida House under the name of Ken Littlefield. So I'm not sure <laughs> if people today know who they voted for. But I've sub subsequently won a couple of times, and as was stated earlier, was sworn in as speaker. But I love the fact that as a 33-year-old, now a sitting Speaker of the House, I get a chance to bring a new dimension to the process, a new thought, a new perspective, our perspective, frankly. I'm, not, I'm probably closer to age to most of the students that are here than I am to my own colleagues back in Tallahassee, which speaking of, and I'm not dating you, Representative Magar, uh, we happen to have one of our newest members of the Florida House who's here, and she has done just a tremendous job already tackling real issues. She was just appointed as a vice chair of a very important committee, and uh, she is doing a wonderful job, and that's Representative Marilyn Magar from right here. So thank you for being here, Marilyn. <laughs> but I've, I've hoped to bring a new perspective, and I've also tried to bring us up to the times a little bit technologically. So for example, for you students or anybody who's into apps, if you ever want to know what the Florida House is up to, you can go to our app. It's called the Florida House. If you, go to, if, you, if you have an iPhone or a Google, you can actually live stream any committee that we have. 
You can read every bill, every bill analysis, and just about anything that we do of substance in Tallahassee is completely at your disposal on the app. We're the first uh, legislative body to do that in America at the way that we've done it. There have been a lot of people who've done the kind of the website, you click on the app and it goes to the website. This is a real, fully functioning app, and our hope is to bring what we do in Tallahassee closer to the people, because I believe a more transparent government, a government that reaches out to people and solicits information from them, is gonna be more responsive to those same people as well. So we tried to do that. And in fact, there's a guy who I don't really share any philosophical uh, values with, uh, or political values with, but he's a friend of mine. He wrote a great book, he's a Democrat, he's the governor of California, his name is Gavin Newsom. And the book he wrote is called Citizenville. And the entire purpose of his book is how technology can be utilized to change the way that government functions and to change the way that we interact with our government. And I, I really believe this to my core, that technology brings a lot of challenges and uh, it brings a lot of benefits, but the one thing it does is it allows us to create new institutions, new organizations. And I believe uh, people like yourselves, people like me, if we engage with our government through technology, we can actually change the way that government works in a way that we never had the authority to before. And so I, I hope you'll check that book out. I never thought I'd be promoting a Democratic's book from California, <laughs> but really it is a fascinating read if you have a chance to, to check it out. And particularly the younger generation, I believe it's the future of how you will see government interact with its people. Now, I, I want you to have a bit of a perspective on why I believe what I believe. There's a, uh, there's a great video I watched a long time ago in a book I read by a guy named Simon Sinek. Anybody ever heard of Simon Sinek? He wrote a book called Start With Why. And the purpose of it is, he said, you know, great organizations, great institutions, like Palm Beach Atlantic University, they don't talk about what they're going to do. They don't even really talk about how they're going to do it. First, they talk about why they're doing it. What's your cause? What's your purpose? Why are you doing this? And I think that the university's done a tremendous job of, of, of articulating what the purpose of this institution is. My hope, and I'm one year through, and I've got another year as Speaker of the House, my purpose, what drives me, why I get up and get excited every day in the morning, is because I believe we have a unique opportunity to do something special in Florida. Now, anybody could say that about their state, but let me tell you why I believe that. I'm very concerned about our country, holistically. I'm concerned about the direction of our country, I'm concerned about some of the challenges that our country faces. But here's the thing, as the Speaker of the House of Florida, I have no control over any of that. I'm not in Congress, I'm not a United States Senator. I can't address all those concerns. What I've been given the task to do is to help Florida. And so I believe, and I don't wanna call it a concept, but I believe Florida has a chance to build what I call a pocket of personal and economic freedom, unlike any other place in America. And I've been talking about this for a year, and for those of you who've heard me say this before, you're going to hear me say it again, because every decision I make, everything I do, is under the auspices of trying to build a special place here in Florida that values personal and economic freedom. And you'd say, well, why is that important? Doesn't everybody have that? No. Not every state has that. Let me give you an example. Today, Florida's unemployment rate is 7%. Three years ago, it was 12 we're on a great hot streak in Florida. Our graduation rate is the highest it's ever been in Florida. We have 1,000 people moving to the state of Florida a day. There are states like California, Illinois, New York that have net migration out of their states. That means there are less people in their state today than there were a year ago, and most of them, there are less people in their state last year than there were the year before. There are very troubling t trends that are taking place, and if states are supposed to be these, um, pockets of democracy, which is what we are, we're seeing in kind of the unfolding of, I believe to be kind of a 21st century version of federalism. You're seeing states take different directions, very specifically, very, very intentionally, and you're seeing the differences in what it's causing. And let me give you another example. Today, California's unemployment rate is 9%. So is Illinois. I believe New York's is somewhere in the middle eights, eight and a half. Texas is at six, Florida's at seven. Why is that? Weren't we all affected by the same economic downturn? Weren't we all affected by the housing market? Weren't we all affected uh, by the financial crisis? The answer is yes, we were. But some states are bouncing back faster than others. Why is that? And I believe it's because Florida has adopted the position of embracing free enterprise and not running from it. Some of those other states have not. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have challenges. 
We have pension challenges in the state of Florida that we have to deal with at the local level and the state level. We have health care challenges. Florida has one of the highest uninsured rates in the country. That's not something we should be proud of and something we should be working on to address. I believe it should be a private sector solution, not a public sector solution. I talked about how we have one of the highest graduation rates we've ever had. Here's the problem with that. Only one out of every three students who graduate from a Florida public school are college ready today. One out of three. So we may be giving them a certificate and telling them that you're qualified to go to college, but then when they go to college, most of them are not prepared. That's a very, very fundamentally challenging situation for our state that we've got to address. And then, of course, you've got your, your normal growth challenges, transportation, water, all those things which are going to come into play and we're going to be dealing with. But something that's been on my heart recently, and I thought I would share it with you this morning, that, that I believe is something, self-admittedly, our party has not uh, talked about um, and, and, frankly, maybe not paid enough attention to. And that is this, not concept, but this reality of generational poverty in our country and in our state. Our unemployment rate's going to go back down. It's going to go back down, hopefully, another 5 or 6 percent, you know, down to 5 or 6 percent, probably where it was back in 2006. But the question is, the same people, the same families, the same organizations, the same neighborhoods that were unemployed before the, before the crash are still unemployed. There are are some really troubling trends that Republicans particularly are not talking about in this country. Uh, I'm not someone who believes that uh, in wealth distribution via government. But I will tell you we should acknowledge this fact, that today the top 1% of Americans earn about 24% of all the income. In the 1970s, it was 9%. Today, if you're born into the bottom quartile of income, the odds of you mobilizing up into the top quartile it's very, very small. This country that was built off of opportunity, which we sell all over the world, that if you come to America, that if you do the right thing, if you work hard, you will emerge, you will grow out of that bottom quartile, is becoming, is becoming more challenging every single day. And some people, there's a big dispute about why that is. Some people think we just need more government programs. You know, if we had more entitlements, that we'd be a stronger people. I don't believe that. Actually, believe government is the one that is causing this havoc on our people. I believe government is one of the larger contributors to generational poverty, not the answer. And so here's the, the biggest problem. In order to break the cycle of generational poverty, I think it takes two things. It takes an unbelievably 21st century based high standards education system that is second to none, starting in pre-K all the way through our universities. The second thing, and you guys understand this better than most, is embracing a free enterprise, embracing of free markets, acknowledging that if someone is smart and they have a good idea, if you get out of their way, they will emerge. And, and those two things coupled together, and you can't do one without the other. You can't have a free society of people who aren't educated. And you can't have a bunch of folks who have a great education but don't have the political system and structure there to support it. You have to have both. I saw a, um, a comment by Bono the other day, uh, for those of you who are Bono fans, and he's like been the international voice for humanitarian aid across the world. I mean, he, if, if, you talk, if you think about aid to Africa and you think about the hundreds of millions of people that are being fed across the world because of humanitarian aid, you probably couldn't point to any more singular person than Bono. But you know what Bono said two weeks ago? He said, aid is a bridge. Until we can teach these countries to embrace capitalism and free enterprise, they will never break free from the bondages that, that hold them down. This is coming from Bono. And he actually said he was humbled when he came to this realization because forever he just thought, if we could just give people more, if we could just provide for their basic needs. First, it's food. What about shelter? How about health care? If we can just provide those things for folks that somehow that will emerge them out of their circumstances. And what he's found after years is that that's not the answer. You have to teach people and allow them to embrace the concept of free enterprise. Now, I know here at Palm Beach Atlantic University, I believe y'all have an American Free Enterprise Day. Is that right? That is really cool, by the way. My university didn't have that. No offense to uh, my friends at JU. But to give you an example of, of this, if you were to go, actually, if you remember nothing from anything I say today, I hope you remember this. When you go home tonight, Google what the peninsula of Korea looks like at night. 
and look at a picture of it. And here's what you'll see. I'll just break it. I'll break it for you. There's the 38th parallel, which most of you are probably familiar with. It separates North Korea and South Korea. Everything south of the 38th parallel at night is what? It's lit up. It's lit up like a Christmas tree. There's activity. There's growth. There's buildings. There's people. Everything north of the 38th parallel. There's people there, too. But guess what it looks like? It's pitch black. It's pitch black. Same people, same culture, same language, same agricultural base. What's the difference? Two things. Education and free enterprise. It's the difference between light and darkness. I believe that. It's the difference between freedom and bondage. And, you know, I could use West Germany and East Germany and a whole lot of other examples for you today. But to me, when, when somebody sent that to me, somebody took a picture of it and sent it to me and said, have you ever looked at this at night? I had never done that. And it was just so striking, so stark to see the difference. And so I'm not saying that the rest of America is going to live in the darkness and we're going to be this bright light. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that maybe we can shine a little bit brighter. Maybe there are some things that we can do to embrace freedom, to embrace education, to make Florida shine a little bit brighter because I do believe people are moving with their feet. There's a reason why 1,000 people a day are moving to Florida this year. There's a reason why California and Illinois and New York and New Jersey and others are losing population. There's a reason for that. And I think that we can, we can build off of it and do something really special if we're willing to take on the real challenges that come with it, which are significant. So one of the bigger I think issues that are outstanding that I haven't, I never really thought much about until just recently. But I've been watching this debate that's going on in Washington, which again, I don't control. But this is the culture, and I'm talking to, to the students now at this point. This is, this is the world you're coming into. As you go into the workforce, I want you to understand fully what you're dealing with. Historically in America, we were built on this concept and this, this, this perception that this generation was building for the next one. That everything we did, the decisions we made as a country, were somehow creating an environment where the next generation would have better opportunities than their parents did. That's, you know, lots of people have talked about that. There's a lot of questions as to whether or not that's true. And in fact, today, here's what I would tell you what we're saddled with. Not just you, but me, as a 33-year-old father of three daughters. We, I believe, for the first time in America, are not just responsible for building for our kids. We're responsible for bailing out our parents' generation, too. We have a $17 trillion deficit as a country. We're not paying that off in the next 10 years. And so our generation and the generations that come after us are going to have two responsibilities, paying off for the past and investing in the future. So the weight that's on your shoulders and on my shoulders is heavier and greater than I think it's ever been on any generation in American history financially. Certainly there have been wars and other challenges we've been faced with, but financially, the weight on our shoulders is tremendous. And we're going to need people who are up for the battle. We're going to need people who understand that. And we're going to need people who understand that that can't continue. And so here's one of my last points. The, the great part, I think, about what I was talking about with Citizenville and technology is that if you look around the world, most of the big transformational changes that are happening in countries, it's not coming from people who are over 65. It's our youth. It's the youth of a country that usually creates the revolution. It's the youth of the country that usually changes the culture, changes the, um, uh, the, the, the direction of a country. Most major change in countries, when you see the overnight changes, what happened in Egypt, for example, which is maybe has not worked out exactly how we wanted, but the, the beginnings of it, the fight for freedom, it came from the youth, it came from the college-age students. And... I think there's a responsibility for people who are under 30. And you may think, look, I'll deal with those issues when I get out and I get a job and I'm comfortable and I've got my wife and I've got my kids or I've got my husband and when everything else is settled, I'll deal with that later. But what I'm here to tell you is I believe that young people today have a responsibility to engage in government. And I don't really care at what level it is. You don't have to be elected to office to be a public servant. In fact, I would argue some of the greatest public servants that our nation has ever had were never elected to anything. Nobody voted for them. 
You don't need affirmation of a vote to tell you to go lead. And in fact, I would also say that leading isn't necessarily, we don't need 100 leaders to come out of this room. I know I mentioned the, the Simon Sinek TED video, and I hope you watched that, but I'm going to give you one other one, because I'm, I'm a big TED fan. I think it's pretty unique, some of the stuff they put out. There's some weird stuff, too, but there's some good stuff in there. And there was this one two-minute video, and it said, how to start a movement. And it's this, I don't know if it's a concert, but it's just, they're showing this guy who's outside, and he looks like a crazy man. And he's dancing all over the place, and he's got his shirt off, and he's all over the map. And everybody's looking at him like he's weird. What is this guy doing? And then about 30 seconds goes by, and a second person kind of walks up, and they start dancing with him. They're dancing like crazy. And then 30 seconds goes by, a third person shows up, a fourth person shows up. Then about 50 people show up. Then about 200. And the next thing you know, the weird people were not the people who were dancing like crazy. It was the people who were standing around that weren't. It literally, it was this two-minute start of a movement. And it really encapsulates what I think how movements actually start. But the point of it was, it wasn't the guy who had the courage and the guts to start the movement. Now, that takes a little bit of courage, maybe a little bit of insanity. What it takes is someone who sees someone out there who's doing something maybe viewed as a little bit crazy, maybe something that goes against the mainstream, maybe something that makes them dig a little bit deeper and says, I'm not really sure I want to venture down that road. Someone who sees that and says, I want in. I want to be a part of that and is willing to put themselves out there. Anybody can be crazy. Some people would argue I'm crazy. But are you willing to follow somebody you think is crazy in a good way? And that's what we need. We need, we need leaders who are willing to step out and maybe be, be willing to deal with some of the consequences of what people will say for telling the truth. And then we need people who will follow and join in that movement. And so, you know, the state of Florida, I believe, is prepared for a tremendous run economically. I worry about the long-term societal generational poverty issues that we have had and we will continue to have until we give people truly a true education and a knowledge base of how a free economy works. And I think if we can build that, nobody will be able to touch us. Florida will be a special place. We will be lit up at night like a Christmas tree. Thank you all very much for today. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to bring some chairs in there. OK, great. Yeah. Great. Well done. Thank you. Well, did you enjoy that? Give him another round of applause. Thank you. Speaker, I want to touch on some of the points that you gave in your excellent remarks, and we have questions that our students, too, have put forward, so Great. I'm going to try to integrate them as much as possible. Uh, Molly Waterin asked a question about health care, and it mm -hmm. was something I wanted to ask you about, too. Uh, you referenced about being able to stand out and be a leader, and during the last legislative session, the state of Florida had to make a choice concerning the Affordable Health Care Act. And the governor, who we both like and respect, I know you're a supporter of, had one position on Medicaid expansion, and you took another one on behalf of the Florida House of Representatives, and then came up with some of your own ideas. Could you talk a little bit about the expansion and your yeah. decision? Yeah, th that was a tough issue. I mean, that was probably the most contentious, most written about issue. And, and so, you know, some people would say the comment I just made about attacking generational poverty goes against my position on Medicaid expansion. They'd say, well, if you, if you care about low-income people, why won't you give them free health care? And my, my, I actually think it's very consistent, and, and I'm going to tell you exactly why. The first thing is, let me ask a couple of rhetorical questions to everybody in here. Does anybody think that if we had more people on Medicaid, we'd be healthier as a society, that that would provide people with better health? Does anybody in here think that if we had more entitlements as a state or as a country, if we could be more like Greece or Spain or Western Europe or you know, Canada, that if we had more entitlements that somehow we'd be a more productive society? No, you probably don't think that either. And so why would we govern that way? You know, we can't say we believe in certain things. We've seen the example of what single payer systems, what government run institutions do, and then go off and do it. This was a very hard decision because really what it comes down to is what do we do for these million people that need health care? And in Florida, it's actually larger than that. But the Affordable Care Act, the way it was passed, and 
the way the, uh, the uh, Medicaid expansion dollars work. The federal government gives you money in the short term, and then the state of Florida has those dollars, and then long term, we have to figure out how to pay for it. They don't tell us how much, so it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a risk. So they basically say, look, you want to give people free health care, we're going to provide you the funds to do it for three years, and after that, we'll negotiate as to how much that's going to cost you. Well, just so you understand, if it went to the traditional match, a 50-50 match with the federal government, which is how we normally do it, it would cost us somewhere between three and four billion dollars a year. Huge money. Now, here's the other concern. Most of the data that shows, Senator, people on Medicaid aren't healthier than people who are uninsured. It's the worst form of health insurance you can get in this country. It doesn't make people healthier. And the biggest reason is because there's no access to care. Most providers don't service people on Medicaid. And so it was, not an easy, it was not an easy thing to do. We came up with an alternative, because I don't believe in just saying no, which we said, if you're disabled, if you're a parent with children on Medicaid, and their children are reliant upon you having a job and being healthy to work, uh, if, if you are truly the most vulnerable in your state, we will provide you with health care, state funded. We're going to give you a voucher, and you're going to be able to go to the market, and you're going to be able to buy private health care insurance. But if you're between the ages of 19 and 64, and you don't have any children, and you're healthy, and of the 900,000 people who would have gotten Medicaid expansion, this is 500,000 of them. 19 to 64, single, healthy, can work. We don't think the state of Florida has a responsibility to provide for your health care. And so we said no. And that was very controversial. And um, I'm sure we made some friends and some enemies along the way, but I just felt at my core, and I, and I think Representative Marilyn Magar, who I remember speaking on the floor on this issue, believed as well that how could we in good conscience give people a card, call it Medicaid, promise them insurance, when we all know that it's not really insurance. And I just couldn't do it. It was a principled decision. Let's talk a little bit about education. You and I, years ago, worked on some university uh, reform to help make our universities in the state uh, better. And we are faced with the challenge, again, of trying to make sure that we have the best, high-quality, higher education in the state of Florida, both through the independent schools as well as the public schools. The governor has talked a lot about uh, focusing on STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math for our colleges, and making sure that our our universities are looking to make sure that when folks graduate, they can get a job. Uh, talk about the role of higher education in Florida, where you think it's going. And this is, you know, a school that has a science degrees, but also a liberal arts tradition. And talk about the role of a liberal arts education. Well, I think, you know, STEM is kind of the new fad. And it's an important one. I mean, it, right now, there is a plethora of jobs that are out there in the marketplace if you have a certain skill set. Uh, the problem I think we have as a society now is we're asking our university presidents and our universities, public and private, to build an education system for a future that we can't predict. And what I mean by that is, you know, it used to be in the 1960s, 70s, and maybe even 80s and 90s, you kind of knew where things were going. You knew what the job market was going to be. Things change so rapidly now, and I'll give you an example. In 2004, the top 10 jobs that existed in 2004, I'm sorry, in 2010, the top 10 jobs existed in 2010, did not exist in 2004. So think about that, just two and a half, three years ago, and by the way, if I, if I change the numbers to 2007, 2013, it'd probably be the same outcome. The job market is changing so quickly, and technology has changed the way that the job market is, is functioning today, that we're literally preparing students for a job that doesn't exist yet. And I think that presents just a very unique challenge. I think the reason liberal arts is important is because it teaches people how to think. Uh, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with a STEM degree. There's nothing wrong with a business degree or an accounting degree. I was a business major. But I believe there will always be uh, a need for liberal arts degrees because it teaches people to think. And um, you know, I also think technology is changing the way that we educate. It's creating a new, personalized, student-driven, student-centered education. And we're working with the University of Florida right now on a pilot project to basically take uh, just about every degree that they offer at Florida, and this won't happen in one year, but over several years, and put them online uh, in a very unique 21st century platform and do it for $10,000 or less, all in. And make it competency-based. So for example, it's not about seat time or a semester where you have to sit through a semester to get through a class. It would be competency-based education. So when you master the content, you move on to the next thing. And you know, not every student's gonna wanna do that, but I think embracing technology 
and also recognizing that liberal arts is, is, should be here to stay. And the fad of STEM is important, and we're going to continue to need to produce more STEM degrees. But we always want to be careful that we don't forget to teach people how to learn and how to think. Absolutely. Florida was in the spotlight earlier this year, and we find ourselves in Florida in this spotlight, it seems, a lot with the trial that occurred in Central Florida on the Trayvon Martin case. And one of the issues that came up concerning that case was the stand your ground law. Even though it wasn't directly implicated in that trial, if you watched the news, you would have thought that that law was on trial. And you have called for a hearing to review that law. And I think to your great credit to allow to have that discussion. Tell us a little bit about how that hearing will go and what kind of voices will come to the table. Yeah, I think it's been a very emotionally charged debate. I mean, every, you know, everybody in here is familiar with what took place in the tragedy in Sanford, Florida, you know, over a year and a half ago. Um, I've had a chance to meet uh, Trayvon's mom, uh, and uh, we had a, probably about a 30 or 45 minute conversation in my office about a year ago, uh, it was now, um, and you feel for their family. Um, I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. I wasn't in office when the Stand Your Ground law passed. It actually happened the year before I got there, but I've always supported it, I still support it. But I also believe we shouldn't be scared to have a debate. Uh, we shouldn't be scared of having a conversation about an issue of this magnitude. Um, you know, self-defense is something that I, is really embedded into our Constitution as a right that we have. Um, but we also don't have a right uh, to be a vigilante and to forcefully go out and do something that is uh, taking away someone else's freedom. I don't know if necessarily that happened that night in Sanford. In fact, I don't think it did, but we don't know. None of us were there. Um, the standard ground law was not used as a defense for Mr. Zimmerman, um, but that being said, because of the sensitivity to this issue, because of the, the outcry on both sides, I thought it was worthy of having a debate. Mm -hmm. But we also want to try to do it in a non-racially charged environment. We want to have a real conversation about the law with facts, with figures, and not one that is driven by emotion and driven by race. I think that is not productive. Well, we'll look forward to that. Uh, this is outside of your jurisdiction, but it's the most pressing issue that we're all reading about and talking about in this question from Matthew Sparter. Uh, what is your stance on what's going on in Syria, and what do you think will happen with the congressional vote, and what do you think the United States' role should be, if any? Uh, that's such a tough question. Um, I'm glad I'm not in Congress right now. This is, this is a real tough one. I have concerns with, you know, the president put a red line out there over a year ago, um, and then it was crossed. And frankly, I think what he should have done is he should have acted uh, right then. And he should have gone to the American people and said, I'm the, you know, uh, I'm the President of the United States, I'm the Chief Commanding Officer, uh, and this is what we're doing and this is why. Uh, I believe he would have you know, faced some criticism from Congress for doing that, uh, but I believe it would have been the right thing to do. I think now what he's done, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's become overly politicized. And now America's in a box. Nobody really knows what the solution is or what the bombing's going to do. No one's been able to articulate what that's going to do. Uh, but at the same time, no one wants to embarrass America or our president. And we should never want to embarrass our president. I disagree with Barack Obama, President Obama, on numerous things. Numerous things. But I also believe that America should always look strong. And so I worry about America showing weakness not, by not falling in line behind our president. I think he needs to make a case. And he's going to have an opportunity tonight on I think seven networks, he's gonna do 10 minute segments. And tomorrow night he's gonna make a speech uh, from the Oval Office. And I believe, I really believe the, the Congress and their decision will be heavily weighted on his ability to deliver mm -hmm. uh, the reasons for why this is necessary. And so I'm kind of one of those undecided voters out there. I, you know, and I don't have a vote in this. Um, I want America to be strong. I think what took place over there is unconscionable. And when you look at that region, think about the nation of Israel surrounded by Syria and Iran and Egypt and all the turmoil that is happening with their borders. I mean, it's really a, an unbelievable feat uh, for them. So we have to look out for the best interests of the nation of Israel. But uh, I think the president needs to make the case. Mm -hmm. And um, it'll be interesting to see if he does. So if he had served in Florida, he would know what the speaker and I do, which is, if you're going to call a special session, know the answer. Better know the answer before you send them back. Uh, and the, the Prime Minister of Great Britain made that mistake. It's going to be a close vote, so we'll see what happens. Am I allowed to ask you how you would vote? You are. <laughs> Senator, you are. <laughs> but unfortunately, we don't have time for that now. <laughs>
No, I, I would vote for it, and I've, I've written publicly and spoke publicly on it. It's a very difficult situation, but when you have a brutal dictator who uses chemical weapons, not on some battlefield, which would be bad enough, but in the capital city, yeah. kills 1,500 people, including 400 children, and you have to have a strong stomach for it, but you can go right on YouTube and see it and see these victims. Oh, and when we say, when the president says there's a red line that cannot be crossed, the credibility of the United States of America to deter Iran in the future from building a nuclear weapon, to deter North Korea from not invading South Korea, is on the line. So it has been as badly handled by this president as any president has handled an issue. He was ready to go. He said he was going. He sent out the Secretary of State, made a speech, thought the attack would be the weekend before last. Then it, Saturday, he stands up and says, I'm sending it to Congress, doesn't know the answer, gets on a plane and flies over to mm -hmm. St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, you know, Bashar al-Assad addresses the American people through Charlie Rose before our president does. So uh, perhaps the worst week in the Barack Obama presidency mm -hmm. You know, that we've seen. Maybe he should send a senator to give his message tomorrow night instead yeah. of him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll see. More convincing. We'll see. There you go. Here's a good question for you I know you're going to enjoy. Uh, Caroline asked a question about the governor's race in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, would you speculate on the governor's race, she asks, particularly if former Republican Governor Charlie Crist runs as a Democrat? Uh, I think Rick Scott, uh, Governor Scott, will win, and for a couple of reasons. The first one is he's done exactly what he said he was going to do. Uh, there's nothing flashy about Governor Scott. You know, I think that we could all uh, know, know that. I don't know if he's been here on campus yet, Mr. President, but um, he's a very impressive person. I'll tell you what's most impressive about the governor to me. He is so singularly focused on getting the economy back on track in Florida. That has been, every time I see him, every time I talk to him, he's saying, hey, I just did a ribbon cutting down in Fort Myers. We're bringing Hertz, you know, a corporate office down here. I was just in Orlando and meeting with somebody about some new jobs. Create Everything he does it's about creating economic opportunity for our citizens. And it's paying off in a big way. And he's gonna have a narrative to show that when I got elected, here's what the unemployment rate looked like and here's what it looks like now. When I got elected, here's what the graduation rate was and here's what it is now. You know, when I got, I mean, he's gonna be able to say, oh, he's gonna have a wonderful story to tell. I think mm -hmm. it may be the best story any sitting governor has ever had to talk about for their reelection. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, uh, uh, Governor Christ is a very seasoned and, um, and um, experienced in the political art. And I think uh, Governor Chris is going to make a run. I think he is uh, going to massage his principles a little bit, uh, <laughs> try to get, him, get himself there. And I think this, the people of Florida will see through it, uh, Senator. I really do. Uh, I've got nothing against uh, Governor Chris. He was very good to me, actually, when he was the governor of the state of Florida. But I think these are times where we need to know where people stand. And where they stand, they ought to stand firmly. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like we're going to get that with Governor Christ. And so I, I think because of that, he'll lose. Direct answer for you. 2006, uh, Marco Rubio, who you mentioned earlier, was the Speaker of the Florida House. Now we're having folks in this country speculate that Senator Rubio in 2016 will be a presidential candidate. So my question for you is, as Speaker of the Florida House <laughs> in 2012 and 13, <laughs> Where are we going to see Will Weatherford you know, over the next few years? Your time in the House will be done mm -hmm. after your speakership. Uh, I know that you have a great future in public service in this state. What do you think is on your horizon? You know, I, I have no idea. I, I believe, um, and this will sound, you know, cheesy, but you know, every major decision I've ever made in life, it's rarely been because I planned it out perfectly and it all just fell into place. It's usually because God just kind of slapped me upside the head and said, this is what you're doing. And that's how I got into office. And I feel like whatever the next stage of life is, I just have faith that it's going to be hopefully something that builds this kingdom, hopefully something that contributes to the community that I live in. And that may be in politics and it may not. I've got three daughters, all five and under. Uh, they don't get to see me as much as I would like to see them and they would like to see me. And that has you know, weighed on me over the last several years. And so if there's not a unique opportunity that I feel like I'm led uh, by the Lord to go towards, you know, I probably will, will step back for a little bit. But if there is that opportunity and I feel like I can really contribute and I feel like it's a God thing and not a Will Weatherford thing, uh, sometimes those are hard to decipher. Uh, we can always talk ourselves into ambition. Uh, we can come up with a million reasons as to why we want to be doing something. Why should we be running for something? Um, but if you truly... Uh, or in thought and prayer and try to figure out, okay, what does God want me to do? What am I being led to do? Um, 
if I do that, I don't know where it's going to take me. Uh, but if it's in public service, um, it's a wonderful thing. Public service is uh, the most rewarding thing I've ever done, and you've been there, Senator, mm -hmm. and it's a great chance to help people in ways. I mean, I'll just give you one example. This was, you know, didn't make the news. Nobody read about this, and I don't know. I think there's one reporter here. I don't, I'm not saying this because he's here. There was a lady in our district. She has a daughter. They have four significantly disabled children. One of them's in a persistent vegetative state, almost like Terry Schiavo, very similar situation. And so they have a, uh, a daughter, uh, and, uh, and she's in, in that situation. Then they have three others. Two of them are blind, all fixed significant disabilities. And for whatever reason, her husband works for the Department of Corrections. He's also a pastor. They live in a small house, all crumpled in there together. And for whatever reason, their insurance company decided they weren't going to pay for the 24-hour care for Sela anymore, who is the daughter who's in a persistent vegetative state. They have adopted these children from China and Ukraine and all over the world because they feel like God had called them to serve kids with disabilities. And, and this insurance company, with the government support, the state support, had denied them 24-hour care for this daughter. And so, you know, I was, I was with the governor. I'll tell you all, this is how cool the governor is. I was with the governor uh, about a, w a week ago or so. I bumped into him. I told him about the situation. He looked into it. He called me back, and he said, I'm going to call Sayla's mom right now and tell her that we're waiving everything. She's going to make sure I'm going to get her that 24-hour care. And he made it happen like that. And in public service, you can do stuff like that. And it's really cool. And that's one story. There's a hundred of them or more that just little things in your community that you were able to contribute to. They weren't a bill. They weren't an appropriation. They were just helping people. And I love that. And if, if uh, God calls me to continue to do it, that'd be great. Well, I think your speaker, our speaker today, has a great future. And you're going to see uh, Governor Weatherford or a U.S. Senator Weatherford in the future. So keep your eye on him. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. I want to thank each of you for attending this event of the Lemieux Center for Public Policy at Palm Beach Atlantic. That's my first of four thank yous. My second thank you is to Senator Lemieux for uh, distinguishing yourself in public service uh, in this nation and for our state and community. We have a special bond um, with you, and we look forward to uh, more events of high caliber just like this for the Lemieux Center. Thank you very much. Thank you, President. My third thank you is to the speaker. I thank him for his uh, boldness, his courage, his creative thinking, and his principled uh, leadership. This is so necessary today in this community and in this world. We heard what you said. Continue that voice of courage, creativity, and principled leadership. We think your service is making a difference. And the fourth thank you that I want to share is to your mother. <laughs> um, because it was, according to you, your mother who invested in you and shared with you that it is important to uh, pray and to anchor your life in the truth. Mm -hmm. And we know that the Holy Scriptures are the source of truth. And you have been called, as your mother has instructed you, to do unto others, mm -hmm. to be a good neighbor, and to serve those in need. We thank you for being our special guest here at Palm Beach Atlantic today. Thank your mother for us all. Well, thank you. Thank you.